Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to Growers Daily, your daily dose of ecological farming insight. It is Thursday, March 27th, 2025, and today we're going to talk about the fascinating world of shade cloth colors, maximizing vermicompost, and what to do about those overwintered carrots now that the winter is overed. So let's do it. All right. Well, great Thursday to you all. I hope it is going well for you. Uh, yesterday, I got some mulch down in a tunnel where I just I, I just don't love what's going on in the soil there. Uh, so uh, it's just it's an area that was compacted for a long time by horses that were being there. And I've been trying to manage it with just strictly with cover crops, which was mostly working, but it's not great for a high tunnel situation where I want more intensive cropping. So I'm just getting some mulches down and working hard on that soil for the summer season. Uh when I hope to plant it up a little bit more. I don't have a good compost that I fully trust at the moment, so uh, some partially decomposed leaves will have to do the trick for now. Anyway, today, per our Thursday tradition, I will take three questions from our Patreon members and probably botch some names and misunderstand the questions a little bit just for your listening enjoyment. Patreon members, make sure to get your questions in and never hesitate to ask uh, simple questions either or hard ones or whatever you want. I'm here to help or at least talk. In fact, I love this day of the week because of just how unique the topics can get, just stuff I maybe wouldn't normally cover. So go to our March thread. I think we're still in March. Yeah. Go to our March thread and uh, put a question in there if you have one or a topic. Our first Patreon member question comes from Patreon member Little Row Farms who asked, quote, in growing summer lettuce, do you have any recommendations for shade cloth color? It seems that a white 30% shade cloth would be better that a then a uh, similar 30% black shade cloth due to the reflectivity keeping the area cooler any thoughts or studies I look forward to your future in-depth lettuce video end quote all right uh great question first uh what shade cloth no matter what the color is doing is blocking solar radiation and scattering it diffusing it so the effect is cooler temperatures and for both soil and plants plus lower relative humidity but also potentially better photosynthesis as more photoreceptors in the plants are able to access the sunlight think of it all of that like uh like painting a bookshelf you wouldn't just dump a bunch of paint on top of the bookshelf and hope the shelves get painted right you have to go through and paint all of the little corners and nooks and crannies and tops and bottoms of the bookshelf to get it fully painted. Same, it's more or less the same idea with scattered sunlight. It hits all the shelves of the plant instead of just the top. Interestingly, uh, colored shade cloths do this light scattering element a little bit better than black, but they don't necessarily produce a greater yield. It seems that from the studies that I can find, 30% uh, to 40% black shade cloth is preferred pretty much across the board. Though I should say that different varieties react differently to shade and varieties that are not heat tolerant may actually bolt easier under shade cloth, at least according to a two-year study out of the University of Delaware. Quote, overall, shading reduced bitter flavor in both years. Shade cloth effect on bolting was more complicated with shade cloth increasing bolting in heat sensitive varieties end quote uh to that point about bitterness one study that i found uh was on how lettuce grown under black shade cloth had lower soluble solids content which is linked to sweetness so keeping the shade on too long may affect the flavor quality and nutrient quality which is partly why i suspect crops grown exclusively in high tunnels or under shade are often not quite as flavorful as those grown in the field it's also why we at our farm don't leave our shade cloth on for the whole time that we grow our field lettuce we tried it for a while, uh, but the quality just wasn't quite there in the flavor or honestly in the yield. It seems like a little direct heat and sunlight or a little stress uh, does the flavor good. What I can't find is anything that would support the idea of using white shade cloth over black shade cloth uh, for lettuce production, really. White cloth seems to be just as good uh, in some cases, but rarely better than black shade cloth in most of the research that I can find. There are some nuanced specific places that colored uh, shade cloths could be used to get a percentage increase in production, mostly with fruit. But by and large, I don't see anything that makes me think I should toss the black shade in favor of another color or white shade cloth. For most of what you will need and are wanting to accomplish, black shade cloth is fine. Uh, or whatever shade uh, the color is of, of tree leaves. 
or, w- or whatever shade you got. And like I said before, when it comes to shade cloth for lettuce, our method is to plant the crop, start with uh, the heat tolerant varieties, of course, and shade it for about a week or two just until it's established. Then we switch to our scheduled hourly misting here in Kentucky zone 6B, where our summers can get up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 37 degrees Celsius, but often linger closer to the high 80s through most of the day. That's like, that would be like your... I don't know, low to mid thirties in Celsius. And you mentioned waiting on an intensive uh, lettuce video. I've in fact done several of those over the years. So although I will do more here on the daily this summer, there is no need to wait. I'll link the last one I did and the last lettuce video I did in the show notes. uh, So you can check that out if you're eager to get more info on it. Uh, Anyway, great question. And it was fun to explore the wide world of shade cloths, though a little sad there weren't more uh, fun revelations there at least that I could find or have uh, seen so far. But anyway, we're going to take a quick break. And when we return, we'll talk about vermicomposting the right way. Sort of. BRB. Today's episode of Growers Daily is brought to you by So Right Seeds. So Right Seeds is an heirloom seed company that offers fresh, high-quality, open-pollinated seeds. They have a great selection on their website of over 400 varieties, along with a planter's library with tips for growing. They offer cover crops and bulk packs of seed for sustainable home gardening. The instructions on the back of their packets have all the information you need to get started. Go to So Right Seeds, that's S-O-W, and use my discount code NOTILL for 15% off your order. That's SoWrightSeeds.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Tilth Soil. Tilth Soil is a worker-owned co-op making living soils in Cleveland, Ohio using NOP-compliant food scrap compost. They wrote us, quote, We're stoked to support Growers Daily because healthier, tastier, and generally more decent food systems start with growers like all of you, inquiring minds who care about the land. End quote. Love the folks over there at Tilth. If you're looking for top-notch compost or potting mix, drop an email to the folks at Tilth via info at tilthsoil.com. That's info at tilthsoil.com. All right, enjoy the show. If you, the listener, are enjoying this content, getting even a small amount of value from it, consider supporting our work over at patreon.com slash no-till growers. Does this work bring you $2 worth of value a month? Five? Chip in whatever you can, and I will try to get to questions from everywhere the questions come in, but I will always get to your Patreon questions now. Today's second Patreon question comes from Patreon member Martin Komaru, uh, who writes, quote, I'm still quite new in the gardening slash farming space, and I'm trying to think about application and use of vermicompost. I have acquired a number of IBC totes with a volume of one M3, that's cubic meter, or 1,000 liters. Since I have access to functionally unlimited amounts of horse manure, lots of horse stables in the area, I was planning on converting them into vermicompost systems, cutting the tops off and adding hinges so I may have easy access. My site is only half an acre or so, and I'm aiming to produce about 10 cubic meters of vermicompost a year. I want to establish a food forest slash perennial garden type area with a few annual beds here or there, and I'm unsure how to use my vermicompost the best. I would imagine that my yearly production is too large for a light sprinkling here or there as needed, but much too small to use as a normal fertilizing compost. In that middle ground, how would you use vermicompost? End quote. Okay, cool. Uh, Great question. And this is an awesome opportunity for you. Very cool stuff. So what I would start by saying is that maybe this is already on your mind, but it might be best to compost the horse manure thermophilically first. So that's like hot composting before running it through the worms. Basically, you want to kill the weed seeds and reduce any possible dewormer that might have made it through into the horse manure, along with any herbicides that might have made it through as well that's been on their feed, before letting the worms chow down on it. Also, if you don't have the Worm Farmer's Handbook, it's a good one. It'll give you a lot of advice on like how to properly manage a worm farm. So anyway, uh, back to the main part of your question, though, about how to actually use the vermicompost. It sounds like you are not doing much in the way of vegetable production or plant propagation, but maybe, like you said, just a little bit, uh, a few annual beds here or there. On that front, one of the ways in which I have and do use vermicompost is to simply add a small amount, maybe like 10% or less, to our potting soil, to our soil mix when we are doing soil blocks or any sort of potting up. Uh, Now, that's for nutrient-hungry vegetables and may not be the appropriate approach for trees. Each tree start will have uh, individual needs you will want to investigate on their own before applying vermicompost to the pots. Using it in your annual beds will likewise yield great dividends. Annual plants go gaga for the stuff. Even if working in a light layer at planting or a bit 
for each crop, like in this in the hole that you're planting the crop. Vermicompost is both microbially and nutritionally rich, so you really don't need a whole lot. Additionally, what I might consider for you, at least in terms of the perennial plants, is using vermicompost slurries as soil drenches around those trees once uh, once or twice per season, just for some good inoculation and fertilization. One study on Kalamata olives in Egypt with uh, vermicompost found that both direct applications to the soil surface and vermicompost teas at varying application rates all had beneficial impacts on root galling and root knot nematode populations, among other benefits. Another study demonstrated the biostimulating effects of vermicompost extracts, specifically in lentil, beersome clover, and sunflowers, especially on mycorrhizal fungi. And of course, I'll link those studies like I usually do. I would probably not add it to the soil where the trees are going to, at planting time, like mixing it into the soil, only because fertilization is generally just not recommended for most trees at planting time. Uh, so it allows them for healthy, you know, kind of even root establishment or extract and dipping the roots just to inoculate them with good microbes before planting instead of adding the vermicompost to the soil, like in any sort of bulk, might be a nice way to incorporate the vermicompost without the risks of, uh, of sort of over fertilizing the uh, planting hole. There are studies demonstrating that the inoculation of tree roots with beneficial microbes, that would be like bacteria and mycorrhizal fungi, et cetera, prior to planting has uh, shown benefits in growth. So long as the vermicompost is completely finished and you're not packing the soil with it, uh, but rather using it as an inoculant, that could be a good way to get them started on the right foot. This is something that we've been doing on our farm uh, with almost all of our trees, and I even have some small trials going to compare trees. I have dipped in microbial extracts uh, with those which I have not, which will take the better part of my lifetime, I imagine, to get any real indications of how it went, but something we're trialing. Uh, vermicompost is such an awesome material, so any annual planting you are doing, especially with vegetable crops, I would make sure to involve that in both the soil and in the plant propagation. Um, all right, I love that subject. I love talking about worms and vermicompost. Happy to do more on that in the future. Otherwise, let's take a quick break, and when we come back, bolting carrots. Be right back. Today's episode of Growers Daily is brought to you by Harnois Greenhouses. Harnois Greenhouses has pioneered controlled environment agriculture since 1965, partnering with market gardeners and farmers across North America to deliver turnkey greenhouse solutions. Their unwavering mission is to support growers' success through innovation and expertise in design, manufacturing, and installation. Harnois Greenhouses are engineered to withstand high wind and snow loads, providing optimal brightness, increased yields, rapid ROI, and long long-lasting durability. With over 20,000 projects completed, they are more than a manufacturer. They are a trusted partner. Their structures foster sustainable, energy-efficient ecosystems that drive profitable, resilient agriculture. In 2025, Arnois is introducing a new low-tech high tunnel model starting at just $2 per square foot, offering open field growers an accessible entry into controlled environment agriculture. Learn more at arnois.com. That's H-A-R-N-O-I-S.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Farmhand. Newsletters, right? A necessary evil for CSA farmers. Join Farmhand and Real CSA Farmers on April 11th for a free digital workshop where they'll share strategies they use to turn their newsletters into powerful sales tools. Get the secrets and go-to templates for success when you register for the free workshop today at farmhand.partners slash newsletter. That's farmhand.partners slash newsletter. And I'll put the link in the show notes. All right, back to the show. All right, so our last question comes to us from Patreon member Kate Starling, who asks, quote, Hi, Jesse. I have learned so much from the show, and I love the daily posts. I planted carrots, mostly bolero, in August and have had nice carrots in the ground all winter. It's not so cold here that the tops freeze, and I kept them under row cover held up by wickets. I want to know how long they can stay in the ground before they change from crisp and sweet to hard and not as good. The change in them I am noticing now is more small roots coming off the sides, but the carrots are still good in good condition. Should I keep them in the ground even as the soil is warming, or should I harvest the rest and try to find space to refrigerate them? I don't have a lot of storage space, end quote. Okay, uh, thanks, Kate, and very fun and timely question. And also, I recommend everyone go watch my friend Aaron from Cedar Chest Farm's recent video on carrots as pants, just as an aside. It's very good. But anyway, uh, carrots are not dummies, and they are certainly not hoping to be eaten. What they do is, during the fall, carrots take a bunch of sunlight and cram it into their root systems to store for the next year. 
in the winter, in colder climates at least, the colds die back to pretty much nothing. When the soil starts to warm up and sunlight returns, the foliage starts to regrow so that they can put up a tall flower and go to seed. In fact, if you were wanting to grow carrots for seeds, this is kind of one way you could do that. Uh, Simply mulch over top of the carrots in the fall and then let them sprout in the spring. Or you could harvest them in the fall slash winter, store them like normal, and then sprout them in the soil, like plant them in the spring. And then at which point they would go to flower. So effectively, if your carrots were in the ground all winter, then they are getting ready to bolt and are converting their sugars back to starches and putting out new roots and tops. Uh, The flavors will change to increasingly more substantial hints of boring and starchiness. Ideally, before that point, you harvest them all. Now, for those of you wondering, I did respond to this on the thread so as not to leave our friend Kate hanging up there uh, until the this question came up in the queue. But if this is something you're going through now, I would harvest them all immediately, at least here in the Northern Hemisphere. Hopefully you can find or did find some storage for them once they came out of the ground, because honestly, uh, those carrots could last you quite a while in storage if you catch them just before they start that transition period. You could also ferment them with some cabbage and make a mean sauerkraut or kimchi for the spring as a way to preserve them. You could also blanch and freeze them. Lots of ways to preserve them that aren't necessarily storage. Or of course, if you wanted to breed your own carrots, you could just let them go to seed. Uh, it's pretty. It's a very pretty flower, and the pollinators love them. Bolero is an F1 hybrid, so the first generation would be interesting, but you could select for whatever you like for that. Like, uh, for instance, reasonably sized carrot seeds. Bolero have to be the biggest carrot seeds in the, all the land. Otherwise, great questions as always. Uh, you all, very fun stuff. And like I always say about these podcasts slash videos, I could have never justified doing a single video on any one of those uh, subjects just on their own necessarily, but I can certainly do a podcast on all three at the same time. So love that and appreciate you all and your support is what enables that to happen. So uh, which speaking of, don't forget, we are now officially a 501c3. So donations are tax deductible and greatly appreciated. Make sure to like and subscribe and follow That helps us out as well. Uh, Enormous thank you to all of our show sponsors. Huge shouts to Willie Breeding for the theme music and to the team at No-Till Growers. Also, shouts to Epidemic Sound for the background music that you can hear. Pick up a copy of the Living Soul Handbook or the Seed Farmer at notillgrowers.com to support our work. Big, big thank you to everyone over at patreon.com slash notillgrowers where, at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, or you sign up in the month of March, you get a shout-out on the show. So big shout-outs today to... Adam Van Quick, Keek, yep, Sally May, and DeLorean. So we're back in our refurbished uh, ghost town in Nevada, which probably needs a name. And I think uh, I think one of the original they named it actually uh, Glacier Cane for the original founder who had the most ghost towny sounding name. And so here we are back in Glacier Cane. And after the mysterious sort of floorboard debacle of uh, the day before, the town was a bit on edge and these new members uh, picked it, picked up on that immediately when they arrived. So there was some, you know, there was like fear and there was suspicion and it just wasn't feeling healthy. So they offered to start a neighborhood watch, which I think is a good idea. Uh, and so the first week, like a week later, uh, this new crew was doing their sort of neighborhood watch thing and everyone else had their houses all locked up and were, you know, they were all enjoying themselves at the, the weekly sock op. That's when the neighborhood watch saw the lights flip on again in the same house where those gold bars had been found and where the floorboards had been torn up the week before. So uh, they ran to tell the town members, but when they returned, the lights were off again and no one was inside. And more eerily, there was nothing on the cameras that they had logically installed inside the house to catch something from happening. Uh, And tomorrow we will finally hear the conclusion to the drama at Glacier Cane. Yep. All right. Thanks for watching and or listening. We will see you tomorrow for Friday. We'll do some uh, pregame for our, for the Kentucky game. It'll be a blast. All right. Bye.